All right. Hello, everyone. And for those who are joining us for today's webinar, welcome to Lens with Advanced Design. My name is Hector Silva. And today we have the pleasure of hosting industrial designer Reach Legal. He's a New York City based industrial designer with a solid history working in the design consultant, consulting and education space. He is currently a senior industrial designer at Aureliden and previously worked at Frog and Smart Design. As a design educator, Re teaches junior year ID studio and process drawing and digital viz at the Parsons School of Design. Reed graduated from Virginia Tech's Industrial Design Program and was the 2012 IDSA Student Merit Award winner. Thank you so much, Reed, for being here. Of course, thanks for asking me. I haven't seen you face to face in a long time, so it was overdue. <laughs> I appreciate that. And today's topic <laughs> is, <clears throat> so you wanna be a design consultant and uh, mm -hmm. Reed and I are just going to have a discussion and we're going to open it up uh, for questions so that you can ask, read some questions and in our discussion, um, I'll integrate those questions. So yeah, let's kind of jump right in. So you want to be a design consultant and that's probably fitting because yeah. you, worked, you worked in uh, probably some of the most uh, prominent design consultancies, um, you know, here in the States. So it's a very good topic. Yeah, it's when you said, what do you want to talk about? I was trying to think what I would actually be qualified to talk about or something I was interested to talk about. Um, but that topic kind of came up because when I started teaching junior studio at Parsons last year, <clears throat> I went in with the lens of how can I give my students the most marketable skills possible if they want to go into consulting. Um, a lot of the other studios were much more like high level based or like um, art based or like what's the meaning of something enough you can't put that into design but as a consultant you have to uh, you get paid by the hour so you have to be efficient you have to be able to completely have a different perspective every time you get a new client you have to learn your clients very quickly so it's just a different type of skill set so I started thinking about that topic last year when I made a whole studio on how would I teach students the skills they need to go into consulting because from what I see um, not many schools really frame it that way. And I can be very like a realist on things and students want to pay off their student loans. So how can I give them the skills they need to make that money back as fast as possible? Absolutely. And um, just to give some clarity here, when you left Virginia Tech um, as mm -hmm. a student, what was your first job uh, in industry? Yeah, so I had only had one internship during school. And it was at a medical design firm in Gladstone, PPAC, New Jersey, called HS Design. They're still around. Um, most of the designers I worked with back in 2011 are still there. Um, like Tor Alden, he is great. He just got IDSA Fellow, I believe. I saw that on LinkedIn last week. Um, but that was the first place I ever worked. But when I left school, I got an internship at a place called Quirky, which is now defunct, doesn't exist anymore. So some of the older people who might be in this chat might know who they are, but they're basically riding the wave of the crowdfunding um, fad, which is still a thing, I guess. But um, they basically took people's ideas that were submitted online. It was a big like live voting every week where the community can vote and then the office voted. And then the design team would take the best ideas every week, give them like a week's worth of love and then kind of put them back out in the world and see if they were stress testable. And then if your idea got all the way through to the end, they would make it and then give you a royalty on it. So it was like everything in the kitchen sink got made like crazy stuff. Um, so that was my first job, but I interned there for about four months. And then after that, um, I immediately started interning at Smart Design, which was literally the next building over. So it was nice and convenient. Just had an extra five minutes of my commute every morning. Um, and that turned into a full-time job after about four months of freelance, of those four months of interning. And then I was about six months of full-time freelance. And then I finally turned that into a salaried position about a year out of school. So essentially, your experience has all been in consultancy, or at least in the environment of consultancies. And, um, you know, uh, as an educator, and I'm sure you also get these questions a lot, a lot of students ask, you know, corporate or consultancies, and mm -hmm. they're two different worlds. And, um, you know, um, 
I don't really have much corporate experience. Um, a lot of it is also in consultancy. Um, and I know that a lot of our viewers here have a mix, mix experience as well. And um, would you ever be interested in going into a corporate setting mm -hmm. if the opportunity arises? Is that something that you'd be interested? Yeah, someday. I mean, I always used to think I wouldn't. Um, I think corporate gets a unfair stigma of being less cool for some reason, but at the end of the day, is having reliable hours and more pay not cool? I don't really think so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just depends on who you are, what your personality is. Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that most people, if they can, should go to consulting out of college because I think it like literally throws you in the deep end um, and then shoots arrows at you. Like you just have to like figure it out and you learn a lot really quickly. Um, you also learn how to design for lots of different scenarios and people. So you don't get pigeonholed. Um, before I got my full-time job at Smart Design, I was there freelancing. They kept giving me like month-to-month -month freelance contracts, which were great at the time, but I wanted to move out of my parents' house, but I couldn't unless I had health insurance and a full-time salary to support living in New York City. So I actually got offered a full-time job at Stanley Black & Decker, and I almost went there. So I almost went the corporate route. Um, but then when I was offered that, I went back to Smart and I said, listen, you guys know I want to be here. You know what I'm capable of. I can't keep going month to month. I got offered this full-time job. If you want me, I'm yours. But if not, I'm not going to be here on Monday. And I definitely didn't say it as confidently as I'm saying it now because I was shitting my pants, like losing my dream job coming out of school. But after a while, I was like, all right, I can't be strung along. I got to do this, like shit or got the pot type thing. Um, so I actually almost went down the corporate route. Um, but in the original question was like, would you ever do that? Um, yeah, I think... I think me personally, I probably have a finite number of years of consulting in me before I just burn out. So I probably got like a decent few more left in me. But by the time I'm 40, I doubt I'll be consulting anymore. I don't know if I'll have the patience or uh, I'll probably have kids at that point and I'll want to have more time. But there's actually a lot of really cool, um, I guess, corporate places. I guess it depends what you mean by corporate because like right. it's like corporate I think has like a stigma of like old school business but I guess corporate technically just means any place that's a singular company and you're designing for a singular brand or it could even be like a suite of brands like lifetime brands would be corporate but they own a lot of brands under their sub category um, but like Peloton is swooping up all the designers in New York City right now they have like five new postings every day I feel like on LinkedIn when I get that email every morning and then Pepsi they swallowed up everyone before that. I feel like most of my smart design friends um, currently work at Pepsi or did at least for a little bit of time because they kind of just said, hey, we'll pay you double if you want to come work here. Um, so it's definitely tempting the more, the older I get to so someday I will succumb to it and I will be a corporate designer. I just don't know where or when. Sure. Um, and, you know, you've, you know, you've worked at, you know, Frog and Smarts and now, you know, I really didn't. And it's not like these are some of the easiest consultancies to just go and apply and get in mm -hmm. it requires um you know a lot of um some very skilled portfolio pieces and you got to know people and i guess what's the secret to consultancy especially in a competitive city like new york city mm -hmm. um honestly i was just like playing your cards right and then just luck to a certain degree where like things has kind of rolled into each other where the skills that got me into smart design would not have gotten me into our leading. And the skills that got me to frog would probably have not gotten me to a different firm. Like smart design, when I came out of school, it was lots of like wood shop, foam building, prototyping, design research. And smart design is very much about that, especially for the OXO products that I spent most of my time working on when I was there. Um, but our Leiden, we don't do a ton of prototyping. We do very rough mock-ups if we need things or 3D prints, but a lot of it is we outsource to model shops that make it for us because we're doing so many things so fast and we live in New York and it's hard to have a shop space like that. So we have, we actually just got a brand new office. So we have a better shop than we had before. Um, but when I worked at Smart, it was like they like a quarter, or maybe like maybe 10% of their office was shop, which was huge because they had full wood shop, full metal shop, full plastic shop, paint booth, like everything you can imagine. It was kind of amazing working there for that aspect. Um, 
but those things wouldn't have got me into Arlene. They would have been like, well, what's your rendering skills like? Can you do C3 curvature continuity on all your models? Like, um, what do you know about design for manufacture? Everything goes to market. So it really just depends on what your skills are and if you can match that to the right type of consulting firm. Because like, just like how people bucket corporate as one thing, when they're all actually different from each other, it's the same thing for consulting firms where they all look for different things. Um, they all probably do up the bar at least a little bit what they look for compared to like the traditional corporate place. It might not be fair, but that's at least the rule of thumb that people usually go by. Um, and that's because when people hire you at a consulting firm, you are supposed to be like the best designer in the room because these companies are coming in and paying you a lot of money and they want to know that their money is going towards somebody who can really give them dividends. So you kind of do have to have a certain level at least have people who hiring you believe you have that level to get in that door. Um, but I'll shut cut my rambling short. The biggest thing is getting that first step in the door. Once you get that first job, the other one's gonna roll together. Like getting in the door with smart with wood shop skills and sketching skills and things got my foot into consulting. But then from there, like I met Dino Sanchez who was the creative director at Frog and my friend Jess worked there. So she gave my portfolio to Dino and I already met him once or twice. And I interviewed and they're like, well, we know he's a good enough guy. We know his work is good. Like, let's hire him. And then our lead and I was working at Frog. And then they said, they had a recruiter reach out. Like, we're looking for a senior. Do you want someone? I had been at Frog for three and a half years looking for a change. So I just said, yeah, sure. I'll go to that place. So honestly, the biggest thing is getting that first job. And then the other ones, like, they don't always, but they more or less kind of like fall into your lap or they kind of roll into it just getting that first one that kind of gives you a little bit of street cred and then you can kind of ride that wave and keep getting the jobs you want over time. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that also is going to build up confidence and knowing that you're able to then take that kind of momentum and then apply to, to some of these pretty big intimidating, you know, opportunities. So, yeah. Um, so in consultancy, I mean, every time I think of someone who's a consultant or a freelancer, I think of someone who is just, like you mentioned, like it just a, an all around jack of all trades, just this badass designer that knows mm -hmm. a little bit of everything, like a generalist. And um, is, is that, I guess, is that correct? Or can you specialize in something? Mm -hmm. Like, can you be really good at visualization and then you can still be a part of the consultancy world? Yeah, I think uh, once again, it depends on who you're applying for. Some people value different things. Like, at our leading, we're not going to hire you if your biggest thing is design research because we don't put a huge emphasis on that. Obviously, we do it, but it's not like smart design, but that's like one of their big core tenants. It's like everything is researched the hell out of it before they get into anything. So it's a different, like there's like level up and down skills differently. Um, but working at our leading, if you aren't an amazing CAD modeler and renderer, and the biggest thing working there, um, that honestly scared me the most about going there was like, I've never worked with people who have such um, impeccable and high standards for taste in design, where working at Smart and Frog, a lot of times it was, yeah, make it beautiful. But the biggest thing is what's it solving and like, what does it do? Where our lead and those are obviously important, but the biggest thing is, is it beautiful? Is it pushing the needle on taste? Is it um, setting trends, not just following trends? And for me, that was something I had to like, really like, well, yeah, I can do that. And like, obviously, like, I guess I have decent taste, but when I worked there, I was like, oh shit, these people really have like their finger on the pulse of New York City, which is very taste driven and very style driven. So working there, it wasn't so much about being a jack of all trades. It was like, can I check those three boxes? And if you can, then everything else on top of that is like the cherries that kind of make you unique. That was part of the reason that they liked me was because working at Frog, I was used to doing very high level design research trips. Like my last trip, my last day at Frog was in Japan. I was presenting for Canon. So we were out there. And then the two months before that, we were in Korea for three weeks doing design research. So like I brought in some of like the strategy level things to hardcore traditional ID skills that I picked up at Smart Design. And those were things that kind of helped me say, hey, I can come in and do the things you need, but also here are some things I can bring to the table that you might not have in other designers yet. And to be fair, other designers in Memphis did have those things too. Just different people had different things. And I had a few things that I think made me stand out a little bit differently based on my previous experiences. So doing your homework is absolutely a must. I mean, you definitely have to mm -hmm. figure things out there. 
Um, what is your advice for, let's say, a junior designer who's currently working in a corporate setting and mm -hmm. to transition into the world of consultancy? It's definitely, I think, a little bit trickier because um, if all your experience is corporate, um, it, you definitely have to work a little bit harder to convince a consulting firm to hire you, in my experience, because they're, they know that you're used to doing one thing a lot of the time. And in consulting, you have to be used to doing whatever the hell shows up. And it might be completely different tomorrow than it is today. And you'd be like, okay, take it with stride, take it in stride and smile and be like, we'll figure this shit out. Um, and not to say that corporate people cannot do that. Because I think anyone who's intelligent person and creative can figure out either space. It's just what you're basically used to and what you're trained for. So if I am a junior designer in a, in a corporate environment and I want to go to a consulting firm, a, I think the skills have to be there first. Like um, I usually go through all the applications at my offices. I did it for Smart, Frog, or not as much for Smart, but definitely for Frog and Arlene um, to kind of set up interviews for everything. And the first thing is, do they have the skills we need? If you have the skills, we just throw you in a bucket. And then once we've weeded it out, then we go through and start looking like, okay, how do they solve problems? What's their style like? Um, what skills are they great at? What additional things they throw in the mix that are really nice to have? So if you're working in a, consult in a corporate environment, make sure you're not getting to one track, like to single siloed, and also make sure you're growing all of your skills. Because if you can show that you have all those skills, even if it's for one type of product, it still says to a consulting firm, oh, this person could do more than just this one area, potentially. It's just that's all they've been given. So I think it's making sure you give people the confidence that with a little bit of grooming, you can become a consultant opposed to just someone who's like, oh, they've only worked on this one thing and their skills are very specific and they don't do anything outside of like these three things like that. If you're too narrow, that's where consulting is going to be hard. But if you're broad enough with your skills, then people might look at your work and say, well, their work's really great and they have the skills. So I bet we can get them to fit into a consulting environment. So it's a little bit of a song and dance. And honestly, the best way to do that is with an interview. It's kind of hard to do that with your portfolio. Um, so a lot of design is like truthfully comes down to somehow getting FaceTime with people and having a conversation opposed to just being another email or inbox. Okay. Um, yeah, it almost sounds like it's easier to be a consultant and enter the corporate world um, as opposed to starting in, in corporate and, you know, in a corporate environment and then try to transition into consultancy. I mean, it could go either way, but, um, I mean, yeah. I think your, your answer really was pretty thorough on how it could be pretty tricky. I, I believe that to be true. I have not tried to leave the consulting world, but if you think about it logically, if you're a consultant that works for corporate companies, you should be pretty easy to slot into a corporate company after you leave a consulting job. Like right now, my one main client who I eat, sleep and breathe every day, like there's no reason why I couldn't do that same due diligence for a different company if I wanted to go and work for them. I think at the end of the day, I think what it is is like consulting can be really hard sometimes. It's a ton of work. Um, it makes you question yourself all the time. You're always reinventing yourself. So if you're not comfortable with that, it might make you feel super insecure or crazy, which something I succumb to once in a while. Like um, when I was in school, my professor told me, you're, you're never gonna be a good designer. You're always gonna be a good designer. You're never gonna be a great designer unless you become comfortable with ambiguity. And that's something I've never liked. I wanted to be an engineer before I found industrial design because in engineering, there's an answer this bridge will fall down or it will not fall down. Not is this bridge pretty or is it ugly? So I always thought it was kind of funny that I even went into consulting because it kind of goes against all of my, like it makes my anxiety go through the roof. But over the years I've just learned to just let shit go and you don't get it, you don't get as anxious anymore. Now it's just, it's like, oh, it's fine. It's just par for the course, it's all normal. Um, but I got kind of on a side tangent. I'm not really sure where, how I got to that. <laughs> It's okay. I mean, right now, obviously, we're going through some pretty tough times. For, for those consultants that are out there, you know, um, trying to gain new clients, mm -hmm. what type of advice would you have for them? I mean, it's, it's pretty tough out there. Trying to get new clients. Uh, it is tricky. I know, like, a lot of the big firms are struggling right now because one of the big things that they 
offer is in-person workshops and brainstorm sessions and co-creation. And that's a gigantic selling point for these um, large corporate bureaucratic companies that don't know how to leave their swim lanes. And you can come in and show them a great time, make them feel creative, get their juices flowing. And you can't do that as well during COVID. So people have had to figure out, all right, what's our product offering or what's our like core competency gonna be now? So I think if you're a junior designer and you're trying to get more work, um, I always think the biggest mistake cons consulting firms make is they don't take on projects that are potentially really cool and noteworthy, but pay little. A lot of times people will only go for projects that keep the lights on and they'll let go like the cool Kickstarter project that might get you a ton of street cred and might get all over Le Manouche and design D zine and dwell or whatever. Um, but they might pay you less. So I think maybe right now is seeing it as a portfolio building time. We're finding places that maybe pay a little less, but are much cooler. And also maybe just ones you find more fun because I mean, I, we took a pay cut at our lead for five, for four months. We all took um, a 15% cut because we had to, just because times are tough, but that's gone back to normal luckily since then. Um, there's a large chance I'm not gonna be teaching at Parsons next semester because they're downsizing the number of teachers they have. So like everyone's feeling the squeeze a little bit mm -hmm. on money and where things are coming from. So I kind of see it as a time where if you're not gonna make as much money as you're used to, just do a project you think is really fun or cool. And like, obviously don't ever do work for free because that's a bad precedent to set. But if you take a little bit less and to see it as like, hey, it's not just me, every human on the planet is making less right now. I may as well like make lemonade out of lemons and do a project I love that I would have turned down because it didn't pay me as much before. Um, I have not had to do that, but that's, if it wasn't, if I was in that scenario, that would probably be the way I would spin it to get myself out of bed in the morning to still be excited about work, even if I was getting paid less. That's really good advice. Um, here's a very interesting question that was asked. Um, <laughs> the way that they framed it was comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that designers can benchmark themselves? Oh man, that's a hard question. <laughs> I mean, comparison definitely is the thief of joy. Um, I like that quote. I don't know who said it or where it came from, but to benchmark themselves. Um, I guess the real thing is there's no such thing as a right answer in design. And it's like, when you do portfolio reviews, people get all stressed out. They get all this different feedback, but really none of that feedback matters except for the person who's gonna hire you. So if we, you and I give someone different feedback at a review, but they wanna work for you, not for me, my feedback doesn't really matter. Your feedback is what matters. So maybe it's just, focusing in on who you want to benchmark yourself against opposed to just benchmarking yourself against everyone because if you do that you're just going to go crazy it's like going on instagram and all of a sudden you see like one day like for a week during like for in COVID, i was like looking at gym workouts and now all i see is like super ripped dudes on my instagram from like and like even me i'm looking through i'm like oh my god i'm a piece of shit look at these it's like the same thing for design like if you're doing it that way you're just going to see all the things you're not opposed to the things that you are good at. And if you're just giving yourself a singular person you wanna like beat, or not beat, that's a bad way of looking at it, like um, level up to or something, it's much more attainable and it doesn't feel like it would be as daunting. Um, but at the same time also like, I don't know, I don't wanna ever tell someone to like compare themselves to somebody else because I do really think it just sets you up for a bad, viewpoint from the beginning <laughs> like maybe someone you want to ins like you're inspired by is a way to think about it more than like someone you want to compare yourself to yeah and uh this is a question that's coming from josh and uh his question is what do you feel your purpose is right now is design the passion that you spend your free time on you're very mm -hmm. talented and i imagine that's because you have invested a lot of time in your craft yeah, actually, I literally spend every waking minute that I'm not doing um, work for Parsons or for R. Leiden on this cabin project I've been saying for years. And I'm in the middle of putting up an offer out for this land that I want to buy. And if it comes back, my best friend from college is an architect and we're going to work together on making this. 
So that's where all my time has been going. I honestly don't spend any time sketching products or designing products outside of work just because I've been doing it now for almost nine years and it's boring to sit there and make another product in my free time. Architecture is similar, but it's different enough um, that I find it really fun and fascinating. So that's what I've been doing. But honestly, at the same time, um, during COVID, I've just intentionally toned down all of the extracurricular stuff I do, just because being on a screen for eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours, sometimes 11 hours a day for work, afterwards going back on a screen to do more work is like the least appealing thing to me so i usually just pick up a book or just like i have a whole bunch of cabin books that is like i'm perpetually reading through so that's kind of where all my creative energy has gone recently yeah and that uh, you know that land that you you brought up it's something that has been um, in your stories for quite some time now and um I would love to hear more about that. Like, are you planning on, on moving into, you know, rural, um, away from, you know, New York City and mm -hmm. kind of do your own thing? Uh, we'll see. I mean, I don't know if I'll do my own thing. Like, I have no, in, I have no intent of leaving early in anytime soon. I really like it there. Um, it's a great spot. And I feel like it always takes a little bit of time for you to find your niche and I finally have like my groove and I, I like who I'm working with and what I'm doing and my client. So I don't want to throw that away anytime soon. But um, when it comes to this cabin project, uh, my girlfriend and I have been in the middle of trying to buy a house upstate. Uh, we just pulled out on an offer for a house uh, last Sunday because it was, it was just too many things. And we're like, we don't want the liability, but that was, we were going to live there for the next six months. That way it would be like, you had a three car garage in the back and I was going to turn one into my wood shop. And the property I am in the process of trying to buy is only 40 minutes from there where it's two hours and 40 minutes from Brooklyn. So it would have been like a nice way station for us. Um, so we both have been trying to make our soft exit from the city or at least have a place to go. That's not New York. Mm -hmm. um, but full on leaving and going like to the country probably isn't in the cards for a while just because I like having a paycheck. I don't want to have to figure out where my money is coming from every day. And maybe some point in my life I'll do that. But I mean, I just turned 31. So I mean, it's like kids aren't probably that far in the future. So I don't want to like, I need to be saving money right now. So I don't think any type of drastic change like that will happen for a long time. But I want to have the property that's like a perpetual project. I'm the type of person that like I need projects or else I go insane. So having that project to like always noodle on for the next few years will like keep me going. And even if work isn't giving me fulfillment, that will. And that's how I've always kind of balanced it is always having something that keeps me going. So you don't go nuts if some part of your life isn't fulfilling you the way you want it to. Yeah. Now, you know, we've been talking about your experiences uh, working at these different consultancies and corporate. Somewhere down the line, do you ever see yourself um, going the route of Reach Legal LLC? I don't know. I always go back and forth on that. When I was in school, I always thought I wanted to. Um, and then I started working at a consulting firm and I saw how much work it is. And I was like, hell no, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but then I saw that you can do it on a smaller scale and pick your hours. And it doesn't need to be this gigantic overhead of I have all these employees that rely on me and I have this office I have to pay for. And that to me doesn't sound too appealing, but I would, if I was ever gonna do it, I'd like it to be something smaller. Like my, my old frog coworker, um, his name is P-I-O-T-R works is his Instagram handle, but he, is this really talented industrial designer. He opened up his own firm in Woodstock, New York. And I went up and visited him. He has a huge, or like a really cool house in the woods. He re renovated with his wife from the ground up with their daughter. He has a barn in the backyard with CNCs and, and plastic injection molding machines. And he's always working. He has like three motorcycles and a Volkswagen bus he's working on. And he has his design space in downtown Woodstock, which is where all the hipsters from Brooklyn moved like a few years ago. And now it's so expensive, it's impossible to get a spot there. Um, but he's like living the life, he's, it's great. I was there looking at a property and I, I called him. I was like, hey, I'm passing through Woodstock. Do you wanna get lunch? And he's like, turn around. And I happened to have like parked in front of his studio. 
And he was like, yeah, come on up, come check out my spot. And it's like him and three other designers all sharing the space. Um, he gets a ton of work. Like he did all the Dr. Jart stuff. If you see like those beautiful, like white and yellow capped bottles, they were all over Les Manouches for a few months ago. Um, but that's the scale I think is more interesting of like myself, maybe a few people I share space with, but I'm not responsible for paying. Um, and then maybe a, a group of like freelancers or friends that I'm really tight with that we can always just kind of hop on projects with each other, but it's not so much of like a huge nine to five, 365 day a year commitment type thing. Yeah, that that's pretty cool. I mean, I think, um, I mean, isn't that every designer's dream? Like, obviously, like, oh, one day, I'd like to own my own consultancy, and obviously, harder. It's it's harder to achieve. It's it's uh, and um, you know, some of the most prominent industrial designers of our time, and a lot of these industrial designers that we look up to, like Mark Newson and a lot of you know the Johnny Ives, they kind of just now work for themselves. So it's it's definitely mm -hmm. enticing. I think when when students talk about this or or even designers. Um, but uh, no, that's it's very inspiring. And um, one question that came in, and this is coming from Marcos, and um, his question is: You talked about how your different design consultancies' experiences have skewed towards different skills, such as research, mm -hmm. model making, aesthetic, etc. What blend of those things have you found to be a good balance, or what environment do you like? being in best? Mm, well, the blend is kind of hard to answer because every project requires a different amount of each. Mm -hmm. um, but the environment I've liked best, that was the last question, right? Last part of it. Mm -hmm. um, oh man, I don't know. I mean, every place has its up and down. I mean, I think my favorite part about SMART was the shop, like hands down, it was just great working there. They also had the best view of any office I've worked in. Um, and then Frog, I loved how they stretched outside of industrial design. So there I didn't do a ton of like, or I did, but like not as much like traditional ID. It was a lot of like really blurring lines, like what is industrial design? And a lot of it was design research and strategy. So the best thing about working there was I got to travel a ton. I think I was there for three and a half years and. 14 months of that time, I was traveling abroad places. I got to live in Germany for three months, went to Japan for two weeks, went to Korea for three weeks, went to San Francisco for eight months cumulatively, I think. Um, I don't know, it was just, that was like a nice, awesome perk, you know, that's travel places. Um, and then our lead in, I think my favorite thing is just the vibe of the people I'm around all the time, just because when it wasn't COVID, everyone was like, did you go to this art exhibit over the weekend? Did you see that new museum exhibit? Did you see the album that dropped? Like, and they are all so on point with every single thing. And I felt insanely behind and I still do. I don't even try to keep up. I'm like, I'm not interested enough to know it all. I'll just absorb it all from you guys as you talk about it. Um, but that, those are like the three things I think I like the most about each of those firms or like the environment that I was kind of in. Yeah. Um... That that's actually pretty cool, and I think, yeah, you know, everyone's kind of gonna everyone's gonna experience different things at the different you know employment place of employment, mm -hmm. and kind of every every design environment uh, will provide um, you know different sweet spots. So that that's pretty cool. Um, so now that you're teaching at Parsons, um, you know, and this is kind of how we started the conversation. How are you preparing your students for a life in consultancy? Like what exactly are you doing um, mm -hmm. as far as like the subject matter? What are some things that you're bringing into the classroom so that they can yeah. transition into industry and be ready? Uh, well, the number one thing I do, whether it's a sketching class or junior year studio is every single critique is with real world professionals. Mm -hmm. So for my sketching class, um, what I make them do is every single lesson builds on top of the, the lesson, the previous lesson. And on the week two, they have to pick a topic for the semester. So every single thing they sketch for the semester is about that topic. So it's like, cause I think one of the biggest pitfalls is you'll see studio, students with like in the sketching section, it's like, here's a ski boot. And then here's a pastel um, cell phone and all this stuff. And that doesn't help. It doesn't help me to know you can draw. I want to know that you use that drawing to come to a smart solution on something. So I make them all do a short folio at the end where 
It's 11 by 17 piece of paper. You fold in half and then you fold it in half again. And then you have a cover. When you open it, it's your resume. When you open it again, you have to tell the entire process of that thing you decided to draw for the semester from 100, like 100 quick ideas down to like three mid-phase ideas, down to a final rendering, and then down to like all the nitty gritty storyboards and stuff that tell that idea. So I don't care what they do. I'm like, I'm, this is a studio. I'm not gonna judge you for how good your idea is. You can do whatever you want. All I care about is that you visually tell a story, um, shows how you can think wide, how you can think quick, how you can think clearly and concisely and concept sketches and how you can get down to like that nice tight final idea and then have all the skills you need to really tell that thing if you're not there to speak about it. And the last assignment that you do every semester is I have two guest judges come in and they have to walk up to them as if they're at an IDSA conference and introduce themselves and present their work to this person. So last year I had Katie Lim, who's the director at Bark, and then Jung Su Park, who's the senior designer at Frog. They were the ones that came in and critiqued them. And then the year before that, it was Jane Lim. She's an industrial designer at R. Leiden, and my friend um, Go and Choi, who's just a badass freelance designer in the city. So they like there, they're learning how to present their work and speak about their work because try and hammer it into their heads in the sketching class. Um, your sketches don't matter a damn if you can't get people excited about it or if you can't speak about it. So I make, if people don't speak, even though it's uncomfortable, I'll be like, I haven't heard from you, you speak. What do you think about this? Like everyone has an opinion. Speak about your opinion, get used to talking about it because in the, the semester, you're gonna have to do this for your final grade. And I give them, each um, person gets a scorecard and then that's how their final grade. It's like they give two thirds their grade is what the critiquers graded them on, the other third is my judgment on how I think they did for their final project. So that's for sketching class, um, but studio, uh, I literally made the entire project as if it was a project at work. So the first thing they get is uh, an RFP, which is a request for proposal. So they get the proposal, which has like the objectives, the timeline, the deliverables, the expectations um, for the project on day one. And the first day of class, what I did was they had to pick out of a hat a brand and then a product and then they had to design that product for that brand so basically from day one it's not about what you find is interesting it's about what your client wants you to do and you have to figure out how to make that interesting so that's the first thing we do and then the whole project like i do it in phases so every three weeks there's a mid phase there's a phase presentation um and my, it got a little messed up because of COVID last year, but it was supposed to be the mid phase. They all came to my office. They had to dress like they're professionals. They presented to the creative directors of industrial design at my firm. Um, and then the second presentation was when COVID had just started. So we did it digitally, but they presented to the head of design and engineering at Smart Design for the final presentation. And then the second project, which we had to cancel because of COVID, so we just extended the first one, was supposed to be um, the a final presentation was going to be for the creative director of engineering and design at frog so that's how i kind of really pull this in it's like that project is very much like here's what you're expected as a designer you have phases here's what phases mean here's all the lingo here's what you're expected here's how presentations should look here's how clients here's how you speak client not just how you speak designer and then you have to put all your money where your mouth is and present it in front of these people because the people at those firms are pretending they're the CEO of that brand. So then they're like, I did brands they all know. So they can come and be like, I'm the CEO of VIP. This doesn't feel like my brand. Why did you do this? And they have to defend their decisions. And yeah, that's kind of how I've spun those classes. That's amazing. How, how do the students respond to this pretty high level, uh, you know, of working um, because this is very unusual obviously like we've all been students of design and mm -hmm. this is unless your professor is you know um quite you know if if the educator has has pulse on the industry and definitely wants to transform the whole experience which is what you're doing uh this is pretty rare in education yeah i mean some people crumble and some people thrive it just depends um i do my best to keep anybody from crumbling um some people get really nervous and I do caveat it with, this is not really a design interview. You're not going to shoot yourself in the foot if you don't do well, you can always come back from this. Everyone here is to help you succeed, not make you fail. So they might get some harsh criticism, but it's never criticism that's like, you're awful at design, you should go quit. It's like, okay, in order for you to get to the place you need to be, here's what we need to work on. Um, 
and I always pick people that I know who are going to use interviews. So I don't get like some rogue person who has a chip on their shoulder and wants to make a student cry or something. So that has not happened yet. And I hope it never does happen. Um, there's always like the old school stories of design school where they make you cry. And it's like, no, that's, you don't need to make people feel bad. You're not going to help someone succeed if they're feeling shitty about themselves. Um, so yeah, I think it's just been really interesting to see how students take it. And I actually found that a lot of the students and especially in my studio class, because studio is a lot more, you take sketching class because you because like, it's an elective and some people take it seriously, some don't. You can't really make someone learn a skill like that unless they want to. Um, but studio, everyone knows you can't fuck up studio. Like that's your main class. So people take that a lot more seriously. And I noticed that my students, it's like a, a few of them is particularly like really just stepped up and like really took it seriously. They researched what they were gonna say, they practiced it and like, it's extra work for me and I'll get paid for it, but I love it when my students have like questions and feedback and like, how do I do this? Like after the class ended, I had a few students ask me if I could help coach them through their interviews for the firms they were applying for. And I was really happy because both of them ended up getting those jobs. And I was like, I was very personally proud of my students and how they did. Um, so it's all about, it's like, as long as you step up and you work hard, people are gonna notice that and they're gonna wanna give you a lot more attention if they know that the attention they're giving you is actually gonna pay dividends for you. Mm -hmm. Because as a teacher, like you probably feel the same way. We really feel proud when you succeed. I mean, that that's essentially, that should be the, um, how we measure success, right? Mm -hmm. uh, outside, like the grades and all that stuff will follow. But essentially as an educator, how you measure success is your students get mm -hmm. that job or get that internship. So um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, that's amazing. Um, what is your advice on escaping the vicious cycle of, I can't get a job because I don't have experience because I can't get a job? It's hard. I mean, to be honest, I was lucky where I didn't have to go through that. Um, I just was very fortunate and got a job right out of school. Or not right out of school. I was home for like two months and I was freaking out about not getting a job, mm -hmm. but then it all panned out. Um, I think the biggest thing is you have to be willing to take a job that isn't your dream job in order to get that ball rolling. Like quirky wasn't my dream job, but honestly, the biggest reason I wanted it was because I only had one other experience or internship. So I needed experience. So any experience is better than no experience. And also they were right next door to smart and I was already talking to them. So I wanted to be able to go over to smart design at the drop of a hat if they asked me to. So it was very strategic and, and like, obviously like it was a job I got and then I made it strategic, but it was very helpful. So I think, one of the things is like, um, even if a job isn't industrial design, if it's graphic design or package design or point of sale design, take anything you can get and build some experience because the worst case, you find out what you don't want to do. I actually guess the worst case is you don't take it and then you just sit on your couch and you feel bad about yourself and then it gets even harder to get that job. But like, and the, and like the least you're just going to find like, oh, I really didn't like that. And I don't want that anymore. And now it's even more of a focused area on what you're trying to achieve. Like if you're trying to find an apartment in an entire city, it's impossible. But if you pick a neighborhood, then all of a sudden it's much easier to kind of see what you want, who has it, and then you can kind of make it more manageable. So I think this in a nutshell, broaden your reach on what design is, find things that you might not necessarily find as your first choice and see it as a transitional job. And also while you're doing that, just like, stay online, go to classes, pick up your skills. Like everyone and their mother knows like Will Gibbons and Spencer Nugent and all these people who have awesome tutorials. Like you can up your skills really quickly if you just do those in your free time, which is always easier said than done. But yeah, I'm rambling now. So that's my answer. And I think the best scenario is you have a job and you're getting experience and you're, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. In, in yeah, milk that job for what you can. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. I always tell like interns too, like the worst thing is a quiet intern. Just you should be there and everyone knows you're an intern. So there's no such thing as a stupid answer. Just soak up as much knowledge as you can and use that to get a full-time job, whether it's at that place or the next place that sees your value. Yep. But never ever accept a free internship or a free opportunity. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I've never taken a non-paid internship. I've never worked at a place that has non-paid interns. Um, my dad used to have non-paid interns and I would get mad at him about that. And I was like, how can you do this? He's like, it's what the industry does. I was like, doesn't that really make it right? But 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's tricky if you don't have any work and you're freaking out and you want experience, like it can be tempting, but I would seriously weigh that against your own morals and your value and like think through what you're going to get. And if they're going to do that, I would, if you're not going to take it, I would definitely be clear on your boundaries of what you're willing to do, which can be scary if you're at the bottom of the totem pole. But like, if they want you to work 12 hour days, that means you're not working on your portfolio after work. So I would just try and be like, I'm here for my eight hour shift and then I'm getting the fuck out. Cause I got to work on my work. That's going to get me a job that pays me and doesn't just suck me dry. Absolutely. Um, well, I think that pretty much wraps up our conversation. I think uh, cool. you provided us with some amazing insights in your career and how other people can leverage some of the advice that you gave as well. And hopefully people are able to apply that in, in you know, their situations in this very tough time that we're in. So mm -hmm. Reed, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. It. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to me talk at you for 45 minutes. It always feels weird not asking questions back, but yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. And it's been great watching these series of videos. Thanks for putting these together. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And for those who are tuning in, you know, this session was recorded and we'll upload it on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you are following us. And then uh, again, thanks, Reed, and uh, have a good afternoon. Of course. Take yep. Bye, everyone. Thank you.